Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about inorganic biology with Dr. Lee Cronin from the University of Glasgow. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode 115, recorded Thursday, October 6th, 2011. The Living Dead. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is episode 115. I hope you're ready for a great hour show. Remember, one expert, one topic for a whole hour of science conversation. I hope you're ready to get dirty because we are really going to dig in today to chemistry, specifically the science of inorganic biology with the gardener chair in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow, Professor Lee Cronin. And as usual, before we get into it, a few science headlines. So let's get started. It's Nobel Prize week once again, and the winners are, first, in chemistry, Dan Schechtman for the discovery of quasi-crystals. In physics, Saul Perlmutter, Brian P. Schmidt, and Adam G. Rice for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And finally, in physiology and medicine, Bruce A. Butler and James A. Hoffman for their discoveries concerning the activation of innate immunity, and the other half to Ralph M. Steinman for his discovery of the dendritic cell and its role in adaptive immunity. Dr. Steinman unfortunately passed away on September 30th, but it was decided that he will be allowed to keep his award anyway. Pluripotent human embryonic stem cells were created from somatic nuclear cell transfer, validating the method which might someday be used to treat diseases using a person's own tissue. However, the process still only creates abnormal stem cells with an extra set of 23 chromosomes. So for now, it remains a lab technique only. Scientists describe the first reptile to be found with a placenta. The placenta is a key mammalian trait by which mothers nourish their young, but an African skink called Trachyleps Trachylepsis ivensii appears to release its eggs into the oviduct, where they then attach to the oviduct wall and develop as embryos fed by the mother's blood supply. Extremophile archaebacteria survived a lab simulation of the Jovian moon Europa. Small numbers of two species, Natrialba mag magadii and Dinococcus radiodurans, survived three hours of radiation and cold in a vacuum suggesting that life could exist on the distant moon, or it could survive a trip from Earth to the moon should we send, uh, send probes there at some point. Salk Institute scientists identified the alarm clock gene that wakes us up each morning. Called KDM5A, the gene encodes an enzyme called Jared one a that restarts our daily clock. Physical geographer Professor David Zhang argued that the little ice egg, uh, ice egg, no, little ice age, shrank people and the economy. The rapid onset of colder temperatures in the 16th century started a chain reaction that led to shorter growing season, lower yield of grain, an increase in the price of grain, people unable to afford grain, and malnutrition that stunted growth by about two centimeters. According to the USGS, the agricultural, uh, agricultural irrigation is involved in increasing sea levels. The process relies on water from stores beneath the ground that otherwise wouldn't be part of the water cycle. In a study in press in the Journal of Climate 
Sci uh, in a study in press in the Journal of Climate, scientists present data that refutes Henrik Svenmark's postulation that cosmic rays and cloud cover are linked. Extending the original data set by four more years, the paper shows a divergent trend between the two. An updated model of ocean waves, including both instability mechanisms and currents, suggests that the likelihood of rogue waves is much high, higher than previously thought. Up as high as one in 300 waves could be a rogue one in the right conditions. And that about does it for the science headlines this week. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Netflix. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your TV or computer uh, instantly, which means that you save time, hassle, and money. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch these movies and TV shows on your Mac, PC, or iPad. Your, even your iPhone, there's an app for your iPhone and some Android phones, too. You can use your gaming console. So an Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii will allow you to watch Netflix right on your television. Additionally, you can use a set-top box like a Roku box or an Apple TV they're inexpensive and very easy to use. With Netflix, you can watch these sh movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And you can start on one device, stop wherever in the middle of the show, move someplace else, and start watching again where you left off on a completely different device. And you can cancel at any time. So try netflix today for 30 days for absolutely free go to netflix.com forward slash twit make sure you use this url to get the deal it'll be 30 days for treat for free your free trial netflix.com forward slash twit we thank netflix for their support of twit and dr kiki's science hour and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with netflix now on to the rest of the show, the conversation that you and I have been looking forward to. I'd like to bring in our guest expert, Dr. Lee Cronin. His work is in, he's interested in understanding and controlling self-assembly and self-organization in chemistry to develop functional molecular and nanomolecular chemical systems, linking architectural design with function and recently engineering system level functions. So coupled catalytic self-assembly, emergence of inorganic materials and fabrication of inorganic cells that allow complex cooperative behaviors. That's from his website bio. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles in a range of high-impact journals and given over 150 invited presentations at conferences and universities around the world. He is active in promoting chemistry understanding and science understanding to the public and you might also have seen his TED conference talk this year on the topic of inorganic biology. Welcome Lee, thank you so much for joining me on the, sh on the show today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get started. Your interest in chemistry. Where did, where did that come from? So, oh, a very long time ago, I guess, when I was about seven years old, I used to go to the local pharmaceutical, the chemist, and um, get them to give me chemicals that I would then go and do things with, mainly try and purify water and stuff. But um, I don't know. I guess it's always been there. It's always been a, a thing I've been interested in. I used to like making, um, I suppose, fire. But it sounds like a Neanderthal approach, but it was more sophisticated than that. I was quite interested in rocketry because I actually wanted to be a, a pilot. And okay. I guess I got into chemistry because of the propulsion. Oh, that's interesting. So kind of the, the, the rocket propulsion systems, the, uh, the, ex the, explos the explosive nature of chemistry maybe got you interested. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I've always been interested in pretty complex stuff. And I, when I was, at, I guess, choosing what to do at university, I think chemistry was just the natural balance for me because I was very interested in, in system level physics. The only way you can really do system level physics is in chemistry. And my chemistry tutors when I was going to university for that was kind of bizarre. So really, I'm a closet physicist and I can only do the physics by doing chemistry. But I guess, as a chemist, I'd claim that the physicists are all doing chemistry as well. That's a really, that's really interesting. Um, there, I've, I've heard people talk often about um, how physics really is the basis of so much. So it, 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 that actually makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess where we are now, and we're looking at, you know, we've got the, we're in the era of the genome, we're in this kind of fantastic era in biology. I guess chemistry really is where the physicists need to be for the fun, because we are coming up on these questions about what life is. In fact, we know more about the origin of the universe than we do the origin of life. And I, that's a quite an exciting uh, problem. Yeah, yeah, it's a very exciting problem. So you've, you've gone from this interest in system-level physics, you're in chemistry, but you're not studying necessarily life itself, the organic side of things. You're, you're involved in looking at inorganic chemistry. So how did you decide that that inorganic was the area that you wanted to focus in? Well, so I've been in organic chemistry for a very long time. I've been making large um, molecules out of um, out of not inorganic building blocks, and we've been interested particularly in making devices and systems of them. And I guess inorganic chemistry is kind of nice because it's predictable, and you can do some very interesting electronics. And in fact, where this all started was this idea of making nano machines. So the way the physicists make nano machines is almost you like you you get some uh, some tweezers and you go top down from you know your fingertips to the molecule, whereas chemists can go from the bottom up. And this is kind of interesting because I started to use a thing called self-assembly to make atoms come together into molecules, mm-hmm. into very big molecules, and to try and make functional nano systems and molecular machines. And um, when we realized we could start to do that, we really realized we needed to kind of get the system to not become alive, but to become orchestrated. It was like we had all the pieces of an orchestra, but no conductor. And biology does this, the cell is conducted, things happen. So I you know, started wondering if we can make life. And then you know, I got lots of criticism, this idea of making life, because if I did make life, Um, and that was based upon organic chemistry, conventional life, then how could I rule out contamination and so on? And being a natural inorganic chemist, I went back and said, well, let's not use carbon. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a a good point. So for people who aren't familiar with chemistry in our audience and the, the, what uh, divides organic and inorganic chemistry is carbon. Yeah. Well, living carbon, I think it's actually a historic, historical, um, term. A lot of my chemist colleagues get kind of um, worried when I say I'm, you know, I'm going to make life out of inorganic chemistry. Mm-hmm. So what I mean is, um, it's very simple in that all the molecules in the cell, we have DNA, most people are familiar with, will be also be familiar with proteins made up of amino acids and sugars. And I would call that organic chemistry for life. Mm-hmm. So I would quite, I wouldn't mind making life out of other carbon based things, but it's good just to say, look, we won't use carbon for now. Let's just remove carbon and go for other stuff. Um, Just to have a kind of uh, a physical delimiter. But what I really mean is we want to make life about proteins, DNA, and sugars. Because even if you do that and there's still carbon there, that's really interesting. But that got me thinking, thought, well, if we just eliminate the natural products that are in biology, what is unnatural? And to be honest, I was really motivated by this uh, very good Star Trek ex- uh, episode. I'm not really a Trekkie or, in, well, maybe I'll become one. <laughs> when they, when, uh, they, have, they discover this silicon life form going through a mountain and it's eating its way through. And, you know, the, the fine line, there's a classic line where it said that it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Right. And they got me thinking, well, is life restricted to organic biology? Mm-hmm. And that's a very interesting question. It is. Are you are you familiar with the uh, the research um, that's become fairly controversial here in the the U.S. Uh, by some NASA scientists and uh, a, a researcher, Felisa Wolf Simon, uh, yes, in which yes. it's arsenic based life form. Oh, I think I think her idea is beautiful. I think um, the problem she had was a beautiful idea, mm-hmm. and and I, I I've read the papers and read the blogs, and I think what she's proposing is not outrageous. Yep. But I'm not sure that the data supports her assertion. And actually, um, the fact that you can retrofit another element into DNA doesn't mean that the, the DNA was able to evolve with that element. I think it's a, that's a bit of a leap. Mm-hmm. And so I was 
I was I was very I'm not worried, but I was kind of surprised when I when I saw the debate because the the person involved, she's a very uh, good young scientist, and yeah. you know the push nowadays to make a, a statement that's controversial, if you like, to get people thinking, is not such a bad thing to do. When you're doing it in a peer-reviewed journal, and your data doesn't back up your idea at that point in time in its entirety it can be a bit of a, a problem yeah the nice thing when i started this is i had no data i just <laughs> had an idea so what i said is okay i have an idea and what we're going to go and do because i'm pretty experienced in building really large inorganic systems i'm going to go to the lab and can you say that again we had a little break so um you said i'm oh, going to go sorry. i'm going to go in a lab and and then so it was a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go in the lab and try and make this and see if we can engineer um, inorganic biology and then get the data. So I have a hypothesis right now, which is controversial, and quite rightly so. Yeah. There is no evidence to suppose. But the nice thing about having this idea is that it releases us from some conventional notions. And I, I think this is the thing I try to get into my TED talk. I ask three questions right at the beginning. And the first one that everyone would be familiar with, what is life? Mm -hmm. Is biology special? And then the third question that people probably hadn't heard before is, is matter evolvable? Right. And that's a kind of strange phrase. And what I meant by that is that we are pretty sure what we can do in the laboratory, we can look at evolution in the laboratory, actually we can do experiments on bacteria, we can do all sorts of things. So, the fact that biology evolves, or organic biology evolves, means that matter evolves. And biology is a very special version of matter, or uses very special matter. So we know that matter evolves, so can we get matter evolving outside of biology? And so I asked another question. And the nice thing is I've set the questions up so they're not really, I take you down my path without controversy. Yeah. Because I think... Philosophy is very important, but I'm an experimental scientist. I'm not a very good philosopher. I'm not terribly able to make these, these very subtle arguments. I just want to go in a lab, do some measurements, look at a theory and see if we can discover something that's profoundly obvious mm -hmm. or profoundly awesome. I think they're the okay. same thing. Yeah. So the next question is, is that right now I think biology has a special, we have a special theory of evolution, which is by, in biology. So I asked a question, which is, what is the most basic kind of chemical infrastructure, if you like, um, or chemical machine that can undergo Darwinian evolution in the, in the strict sense? And the answer is a bacterial cell. And so when you realize that the only thing present in the universe that we know naturally occurring that can undergo evolution is a bacterial cell, and all, you know, and all the life that comes from that. That's amazing. People will say, oh, but we could do evolution in a computer or evolution occurs in social media and so on. But that's kind of a higher level emergent evolution, which is intangible and not so easy to do an experiment on. So there's lots of things we can unpack there as, as, a, as we discuss things today. Yeah. I'm so I, I, there's so many so many questions that come to my head so in biological evolution there is a um, you you have um, heritability um, natural selection being a main component of, of mm -hmm. evolution um, mutations usually being a very high driving factor as well as um, uh, outward environmental influence so um, how are you taking these these facets of evolutionary theory and applying them experimentally? Yes, so that's a really important question. So what we've been doing for a while with, with collaborators um, in the UK um, and abroad is there's a huge, the first thing to say is there's a huge community out there looking at this in terms of understanding the origin of life as well as creating life. And what most people agree that you need are probably three important components. You need a container. Mm -hmm. You need information, and you need a metabolism. You need an, you need a way of processing processing energy, and coupling that to raw materials. Mm -hmm. And if you have those things together, then you may be able to get evolution, and that's what appears to happen. And when we started discussing with colleagues, we came up with this idea of a cell, of making a chemical cell. 
it's not just my idea. There's a, a bunch of a bunch of us who came up with this idea that emerged and say, well, look, only things that have an identity can evolve. And that's why this whole idea about kind of global evolution is difficult, unless you say planet Earth is an entity and it, it evolves. Mm-hmm. And well, then, then things get really complicated. <laughs> so we're going back to your, your uh, requirements. If you could somehow make an object um, that had a, had a container and you could put your metabolism in and then put the information in and somehow um, put that into different environments, would you start to get adaptation? Uh, and would the, would the device, if you like, accumulate information at, as well as other random events from the environment mm-hmm. to make it fitter or less fit? And then there, there would be a process of surviving or dying. Yeah. And so I think that's a really nice thing to want to do. But chemically, it's incredibly hard because this minimal one we have that does it is the bacterial cell. Right, and the and the bacterial cell has all sorts of mechanisms in place to make it uh, to make it energetically more more likely that the change would happen. So there are enzymes, um, uh, catalytic um, enzymes, that actually will allow energetic um, processes to take place that wouldn't normally take place unless there's a really high input of energy. So, so this is one of the really fundamental things about life that's really interesting. Um, you know, we, we think we understand that the universe started with a big bang. Everyone goes back to the big bang. Well, everyone goes back to the big bang for one important reason. We now seem to think the big bang was incredibly ordered. So you can imagine, like I try and convince my son who's five to, um, to clean up his bedroom and make it perfect. And he, he did it for a while. <laughs> so everything is perfectly ordered. And then my three-year-old son would come in and just basically He's three. Exactly. <laughs> and he would, destroy, he would destroy the room. And so my three-year-old coming into the sun, kind of uh, his three-year-old son coming into the room with a five-year-old who had just cleaned up his room, made me kind of imagine that that was the beginning of the universe. You have perfect order. And then in comes this disorder. Now, as the universe has become less and less ordered, something very strange has happened. We've had the stars. The stars explode. Matter is produced, pushed out planets form, chemistry becomes possible, and life has emerged. Mm -hmm. And so there is some interesting thing going on that we just don't get. There is a fundamental physical principle that we don't yet really grasp. And it's locked up with the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And it basically says that if you have the right amount of energy and the right amount of chemistry, complex things can happen. You have too, too much energy, you just get it's too energetic, nothing sticks together. If you have too little energy, the thing will die, you know, it will just be frozen. So this exploration about life coming out of this kind of container metabolism of information is actually asking me a, a fundamental question, I think, is does matter, all matter, want to evolve? And that is, is all the matter in the universe invo- involved in a competition, an arms race? And so that's a fascinating that's question. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it gets to it at a very, I mean, it just takes it down to a very fundamental level. Are we looking at, are we looking at um, matter from, is it a, an atomic perspective? Um, you know, I've, from a, from a biological background, which I have, you, we learn to think of everything from, you know, this kind of selfish gene idea that it's, you know, the genes that are, are driving everything forward and, and, Um, driving the evolution of life Um, but is it even more fundamental than that is it is it just the physics at at action yeah I mean that's like I'm relegating myself to a physicist again it's pretty tough (laughs) Uh, and I think you're right and I don't think but I think it's all about hierarchy of information nuclei atoms can't store that much information but when you connect them together so they form molecules, mm-hmm. and then those molecules themselves can form lipid, you know, can form micelles or oil droplets or something. Then, then more interesting things can happen because you can basically record information, record data in them, and maybe then express that data, read out that data via a process. But we just don't get it. And so one of the things I like, I love things I don't understand. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about being a chemist because. Yeah. One of the reasons I'm really an organic chemist is I'm just pretty stupid. 
but I'm able to make, obs make observations. And inorganic chemistry is a pretty tough subject because there's lots of facts. So I, I think that we want to try and correlate those facts, of course. But when it comes to this emergent effect that you've got going on in bio biology and emergent effects in chemistry, we are, we're not clueless. We are missing something pretty big. And so that's why I'm really excited about this and why I'm, I think, brave enough to come out with these outrageous questions. Because the thing that I was able to say during the TED Talk, and I can say to your viewers now, if you don't agree with me, and, you, and, and I don't want to insult anyone religiously, because I think that's, that's not a question here. I'm talking in the factual world, as it were, and there's always room for religious uh, parts of that. But I was going to say, if you accept that you're alive now, there was at some point where there was no life on this planet. And so life had to come from somewhere. And so that's kind of interesting because everyone, that gets everyone thinking because most people would agree that life had to come from somewhere, mm -hmm. whether it was, whether it was you know, an, a creator or a creation event or a natural process or a seeded process, or whatever, life had to come here. So there's a question mark about that. And the world, the, the planet Earth hasn't been here for, you know, that long. It's been here for about 3.8 to 4.2 billion years. Seems a long time. But it's not that long. In, and In the scheme of the universe, really, it's not exactly. that long. Yeah. And life, basically, people thought that life was incredibly rare in this universe. And, you know, life struggled into existence. Well, if it struggled into existence, life on this planet... Um, first appeared about 3.7 billion years ago, 3.6, 3.5, depending on who you talk to. But literally, as soon as the Earth was solid enough um, um, you know, to have an ocean on an ocean floor and then, and then, some, then, then I guess some land got to go with it, life was there. doesn't sound that hard to me. So there, we are missing something. And going back to yourself as Gene, that's a really nice um, uh, question. I'm not sure that I understand all of Dawkins' ideas about the selfish gene because I think matter is a database. Right, actually. that it's information, there's information processing that happens. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that probably the selfish gene does become selfish matter. And so we can have matter competing and, uh, you know, we enslave matter. And so some, I, you know, I enslave I this chair. Exa exactly. <laughs> this matter right. will be a chair, and that matter will be a camera that will take my picture. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so th there is a bit of that, and obviously there's a, a anthropomorphic kind of um, element that goes with this. There's all sorts of philosophical issues. I mean, after my TED talk, people spent ages talking about consciousness, and I wasn't going to really. In get involved with that question, but I thought it was yeah. really funny because I realised for myself, I can't measure consciousness, and I don't know anyone who can. We can measure self-awareness. And I thought, well, isn't consciousness, and this is going way off piece, we'll come back to consciousness <laughs> in a minute, but, okay. but isn't consciousness really an illusion of evolution to make you care about yourself? You know, we all have egos, we all want to, you know, we all you know, love our families and want people to respect us and want status and so on and so forth. But it's probably an illusion because matter is competing. And the matter that happens to make up me wants to, you know, beat the other person, um, be, it, be it an athlete or a scientist or whatever. Mm -hmm. So maybe consciousness is just a system level illusion or something that can't, came out by accident. And... Um, and that, yeah. so I, I put this on the on the on the uh, on the web and said, look, this is tongue in cheek, but uh, yeah, it set a, set a little ball rolling, and people I think are still debating it now. I have no idea. I just think it's really fun to ask what evolution can do, because um, we are conscious from one perspective, but you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, then probably you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably probably not, but. Maybe it's also the question of actually being understanding it well enough to be able to know how to measure it. There are lots of things in physics that we have ideas about, but um, until we get the tools or the the proper perspective on something, we don't. Or asking the question the right way is often often the important side of that. Yeah, yeah, and this was what comes with emergence, you know. Yes. It, 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 this whole idea that 
that atoms are aware. Well, they're not. Molecules are not aware. Molecules can compete better than atoms. But actually, you, you, this is always I have a kind of hardware software view. I'm actually using a Macintosh with Windows on it right now. And after, you know, what happened yesterday, where the world has lost a kind of a visionary person, I guess he wouldn't be too happy. But, well, maybe he would be happy because I'm using Mac software, Mac hardware. Right. But what the point I'm trying to make is the hardware doesn't actually know what the software is doing. It's a system level thing. Yep. And in biology, and you have that thing as well. So there are many hierarchies. So I guess what we're trying to do in this idea of inorganic biology is kind of create the system level emergence in a complex chemical system and tame it. And we're not just doing this for fun. I don't have a God complex, not yet. Um, I hope not, anyway. <laughs> there, there, are, there are some real reasons. The, the, the real reason I wanted to do this actually is my frustration with top-down nanotechnology. I want to realize the dream of nanotechnology in terms of making molecular machines that can build themselves and can build self-repairing architectures and put computing devices everywhere and make everything smart and get energy, harvest energy, convert energy rather from the environment. And the way to do that, the best way to do that, the way it works is what biology does. The ultimate nano machine is a cell. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I want, and the ultimate nano machine that can repair itself is a self-replicating cell. So one of the real reasons I got into this was just to see if we could realize the dream of nanotechnology using chemistry rather than electrical engineering and um, top-down physics. That's a, I think that's a really, really interesting point and question is, you know, how do you, how do you get a system that is self-replicating that, um, you know, maybe it will develop some kind of consciousness. Maybe that's because it's a system level thing. Maybe it's not necessary. Yeah. Maybe it just needs to replicate and adapt to the environment that it needs to, to get into. So where yeah, do you... I mean, self... Sorry, Bob. No, no, go ahead. I... With your point. I was just going to say self-awareness is what you want all things to have. All life is self-aware. It's just that level, isn't it? A mm -hmm. cell is self-aware, but it's not having a debate like we are or a discussion about something. Right. It so, can, it can, the, the bacterial cell can sense its environment. It can um, usually uh, know the pH of the environment, the temperature. Um, there are chemical sensors to be able to determine whether there are other individuals of similar different type, whether there are threats that the, the cell should be aware of and respond to appropriately. So that's self-awareness, the awareness yeah. of, the, of, the of its own boundaries and mm -hmm. how to keep contained and successful within those boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think this whole idea of self-replication is really intriguing because self-replication is happening all the time um, for stability. Now, when I talk to people about replication, chem there, there's a really, well, I should say, there's a really good um, discipline, sub-discipline in chemistry, where there are organic chemists who are making self-replicating, minimal self-replicators, molecules that can make themselves. And that's really cool. And the, the thing I'm trying to do is incorporate those into the systems. I mean, they are as well. We're in a race. But I'm selling myself the race of doing with inorganic molecules. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea about replication is replication why would matter replicate? Well, it's more, it is a more stable thing. And the way I try to explain this to my students is say, well, look at your photographs. The photographs you took maybe five years ago, how do you keep them stable? And they look at me as if I'm mad. Print them? Well, okay, you can print them. But then what I'm getting at is you copy them. You must copy them from disk to disk to disk because the formats will become um, obsolete. Yeah. So the only way to keep that data in play is by replicating it. And so that's a kind of interesting idea as well in terms of the only way you can keep some information in play to keep things getting sophisticated is to replicate it. And so maybe matter has discovered this, well, matter has, because we're here. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, so the more I think about this, the more I have to set, think about how we set up the minimal system in my laboratory, and we're doing it right now. Um, and we've done it to some extent. I mean, when I... When I was, challenged, I was challenged at the end of the TED Talk to say, um, you know, when are you going to make inorganic life? And the guy was expecting, Chris Anderson was expecting, I was going to say, maybe, oh, it's going to be really hard. It's going to take 50 it's years. It's going to be years, yeah. 10 billion, 10 billion dollars, blah, blah, blah. And I just said, oh, I was actually caught off guard. And I just told him what I thought we had, we, we set ourselves an, 
a, a deadline of about two years' time. In fact, probably it's actually less than that. We sent ourselves about a year, about 18 months, then six months to validate it. And this is the very first step, you know, not, not to have a, you know, a new creature, you know, chemo blob <laughs> that, can, that can, you can pattern and give chemistry to. And, but I'm saying that, that we will make in about 18 months an object that can basically go through a maze and evolve and replicate and come back around and that data can be recycled and it continue doing that process and come, coming fitter. Um, and I think we've actually done it and I think some other chemists have done it. They may not explicitly realise it, but I think and there are some groups working on it. And it's yeah. a question of validating it and right. being able to convince your peers that you have an evolvable object, evolvable matter. You uh, had a paper that recently came out in the Enguant Chemie. I, I know I'm probably uh, not pronouncing that correctly, but uh, that, that described some of the work that you're, you're doing. Where, where are you currently that you can tell us about in, in the process in your lab? So, okay, so we're, we have, the, the paper that came out in Agavanta Shemi was, uh, we, 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 I guess it's kind of act now, we called these eye chills. Eye chills, so when yes. we first when we first started with our friends, um, so we're, we're working with a group in Oxford and two groups in Nottingham in the UK, we came up with this idea that cells are important, but, it, but we wanted to distinguish our cells from biology, so we gave it a brand name, a chemical cell, a chell. Well, I made one that was all inorganic, so I thought, well, let's call it an eye chell, because I was iPad mad by then. <laughs> so, so I hope Apple don't sue me. It's, you know, it's good for them as well. <laughs> but, so in this paper, we discussed making inorganic chemical cells, and that was merely the ability to fabricate an object where you have a membrane made out of metal oxide with some other material, and then we could put reactions inside the cell. And rather like a normal cell, you can have partitioning of reactions. So we've demonstrated that, we've demonstrated the mass fabrication. Where we are in the lab, I suppose I can say that we are trying to, and what by saying that I think we mean we have, but I don't want to say that officially because we have to get this peer reviewed. Right. But we are trying to make molecules that self-replicate and the, these molecules themselves can form the cell wall. So the molecules inside the cell that replicate can also make the cell wall. So you make a, a different, so you make a cell with a given set of molecules in the cell wall, and we can call this cell wall, this cell A. And inside it, it has a bunch of molecules A. Then what we can do, because these are, this is a polymer, it's like a load of building blocks, a bit like DNA, mm -hmm. we make a different configuration, molecule B. And then we try and get molecule B to self-replicate and make a cell wall inside. And then what we do is we have a robo war. I don't know if you have that in the US. We have robots that fight each other and people are yeah, controlling yeah. them. So we have an eye chill war. And we get cell A and cell B together and we say, come on, dudes, slug it out. And what we're trying to do at the moment is get the chills to exchange the best replicator. Mm -hmm. And or to realize that by combining the replicators, they have an advantage. So they make a hybrid cell where you have both sets of replicators and this cell is then more stable or more fit than before to go through different environments. So, that, so we've, we're, we are a significant step, at least conceptually, down the road to making that happen. Um, we have to build some very special systems because there's no way, you know, the chill we're making is feeble, it's terrible. We have to make a whole life support system for it. it yeah. There's no way it's going to... And this is another thing, because people are obviously concerned that I'm going to be making, you know, um, gray, this, this gray goo. That's the gray goo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we can discuss that, actually. It's impossible that that will happen. But be, just because I can say it's impossible, I think it would be extremely arrogant just to dismiss it. So what we've actually done is we've assumed it's a very serious threat, and so we've built in some safeguards to... Uh, to the system. I think that a lot of people will be uh, happy to hear that you say that because um, as you talk about you know these self-replicating nanomachines that can adapt to environments and they're going to be you know have a protective cell wall and yeah, are they going to be the gray goo that takes it that takes over everything or have you created them you know with um, you know like the laws of of the intelligent robot where <laughs> <laughs> they will not destroy oh. their creator. <laughs> well, there's a problem, you see, and this is why hopefully I haven't got the God complex yet. I'm not intelligent enough to design something that's foolproof. 
Yeah. So I think anyone who says, oh, we're going to make this self-replicate, it's going to be really intelligent, but it's not, it, can, it will have this inbuilt thing which will cause itself to turn off. And we've done something more fundamental than that. So we've looked at evolution. Now, the person who came up with Grey Goo, I guess it was Michael Crichton? I don't know. I don't remember who came up with it. Yeah. But, I know I've anyway, read it, but yeah. Grey Goo is just shows whoever came up with it doesn't understand evolution because if evolution is right, if Grey Goo was right, we should be Grey Goo now. But when we go out into the, into the countryside and we see all, all the wonderful diversity of biology, that tells you that Grey Goo can't happen. Because what will happen is the Grey, let's just say Grey Goo started to happen, it will differentiate and there'll be some blue goo and there'll be some red goo and there'll be really cool goo that will then get into a different niche. So the grey goo, don't worry, we, won't be, we might be different colour goo. <laughs> so, so, so the planet will be covered in rainbow hues <laughs> of goo, so anyway, it, just, it won't be grey. <laughs> so what's the serious thing? Well, what we've done is we've built an evolutionary baggage. So what we've done is we've built shells out of very rare metals. Uh, rare metals are, are very expensive. Hmm. Um, and there's just not enough out there in the biosphere. They have to be mined. They're purified. They come to me in my lab. So even if this cell escaped, it would be, it would just die immediately because it wouldn't get the food. And so when people say, oh, you just don't understand evolution. Evolution is much more intelligent than you, know, you are. It will get around it. Well, it can't because the fundamental premise or the fundamental building blocks that this evolvable ent entity will be constructed upon are based upon these rare metals. Yeah. And, and there's no way around that evolutionary baggage. And then if people are still concerned, I would say, well, look, whoa, don't, you should perhaps be more concerned with synthetic biology um, in, in our, and synthetic biology is very well regulated. I'm not trying to say, well, you should be scared about this thing. But what I'm trying to do is allow the person to think critically and put it in context in the hierarchy of concern. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think nanobots and my eye gel, if it, and it's, it's so feeble that it's not going to do anything um, it, on its own. It needs me to help it or needs the reactor to help it. Uh, I think that that's not going to do very much, but trying to build fitter systems and understand its dependencies is really important for us understanding it and regulating it. And just because something can't happen doesn't mean we should just be blase. So the way we do it in my lab is we're very careful in, you know, storing all the heavy metals, destroying everything afterwards and so on, and really treating it almost not quite like a biohazard because we're nowhere near a system that can even, you know, replicate. We're, we've got copying systems, but that, they exist already in science. But I think it's important because I like to, well, I personally like to engage um, with everyone to tell them about science and how interesting it is. And I want people to be as critical as they can, think critically about the things they hear, and to say, well, is this really possible? Um, so it's important to me to kind of be able to, vote, to, to have a debate about the ethical consequences. Um, of course, I want to be that, you know, just because it's there, we should make it. But I'm not really um, that much of a, of a, I guess, chemist. Is a very, chemistry is a very practical subject. And um, you, you, you're interested by certain phenomena and you want to chase them. But I think world domination by nanobots is not the game. <laughs> <laughs> world domination by nanobots. You could probably do it through chemistry, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we already are. I mean, viruses, you know, control us, right? Viruses somehow are... By, and and that's, that's, a, that's an interesting, interesting question, too, because viruses, there's a, that, that thin dividing line, like when we talk about what is alive and what's not alive, yeah. um, viruses are right on the border there, you know, especially the larger ones. Um, and, and are you taking um, any, uh, I know in the in, inorganic sphere, are you taking any instruction from either uh, viruses or these, these other smaller... Yeah almost alive um, biological well, or origins? I think that's a, a very important thing. And when it comes to life, what actually happened when life emerged on planet Earth, I guess, is that you had a bunch of specialist units that were actually associating. Right? You imagine a froth on the surface of the ocean, some bubbles. And one bubble was really good at getting, trapping the light from the sun and producing some kind of organic material. 
that it could, could be used in the metabolism. And one bubble was very good at storing information and one bubble was very good at uh, fixing nitrogen or something. And they worked cooperatively. But if you separate the, those three bubbles, there would be, it wouldn't be functionally alive. So I think the definition of life needs a rework. Hmm. And one of the things I did to be as provocative as possible uh, in, my, in, in, in this whole construction of this idea is I came up with a, a, a more relevant um, and measurable definition of life. And I merely said it's matter that evolves. Now, viruses on their own can't evolve. They can only evolve when they are in a cell. Hmm. So a virus and a cell together can evolve, therefore they are alive. Virus outside the cell is not alive. In much the same way people would agree that taking DNA and replicating it, doing PCR for ready for um, um, sequencing and so on, that's not alive either. Right. So we come back to this universal definition of life, which I suggest in the end is matter that evolves. So if you have some matter that can evolve on its own without you, then it's alive. And it's as simple as that. <laughs> um, <laughs> rewrite and that, rewrite all the textbooks if, if people take this up. <laughs> well, I think, I think if we're able to do it in the lab, I think if we're able to start making entities that can evolve, then we can really, you know, unpick this question. And I think the question itself is extremely, it's an exquisite question. It's not the most meaningful question to answer because when you have a debate with, you know, 10, well, the number of people you have the debate with, the number of answers you're going to get, because everyone has their own particular take on life. So what I was anxious to do is to work out what can we measure. Because at the end of the day, if I'm even going to match, even get, get 1% of the way uh, we project on this road, if I am not able to convince my peers that we are making an evolutionary entity and that by a test and a measurement and a fit and a fit of some description, then we're, you know, there's no point in doing the science. It's the same thing with science. If you can't really have a repeatable result that you can then demonstrate um, in other laboratories, then you know it's it, it's, it's it's not science. It's something else. Yeah, it's so it's, I think it's, the it's just an anecdote that you're able to tell. <laughs> exa exactly, and I think well, that's where we are at the moment. We are in you know the ideas we've got here. They're cool ideas, and they're getting people to think and. That's, I really like that because it's getting me to think about this because I'm able to challenge my, my, my students and my postdocs and just say, well, look, what do you really mean by evolution? And I don't really think we get, we get it. We can see it. We know it's going on, but it's not completely captured. And biology is such a high level um, uh, subject. Yep. It's, it's so complicated. It's really difficult to unpick it. So if you can do molecular evolution with molecules, then you might be able to see something new that, that um, we weren't aware of before. Yeah, and it might give all sorts of insights into the higher level biolog biological systems. So looking at yes, it. Yes, ex ex yeah. exactly. Well, I think this will develop a whole new technology. And that's where the cool thing comes. You know, why, if someone says to you, why are you doing this? And say, well, look, imagine I can evolve a, well, a, a material to your specification, and you tell me your specification is okay. I want a, I don't know, a material that survives under certain conditions. Let's say I want to make a, I don't know, sunscreen, a sunscreen that has, works for four hours, changes color when it starts to degrade, it's non toxic, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. Well, the way you'd make it is by trial and error at the moment, but your knowledge of formulations. But if you set up an evolutionary process to build that, mm then you could evolve your chemical. Now, in comp computational science, people evolve all sorts of things. The iPads evolve, the cars evolve, the airplanes evolve. They're done in electronic infrastructure. Yeah. That electronic infrastructure was put there by us. Yeah. So, it, so in terms of deep and meaningful, it depends upon us. But if we want to do chemistry, uh, evolvable chemistry, then we, we, we need to, to Te uh, tease us apart and it will give a new technology as a result because we'll have evolutionary wear rather than uh, imagine you can evolve a drug so you know you have a particular disease state that's unique to you you then take your disease state and you evolve your drugs to, to that disease state so you do personalized medicine let's say you we're able to take artificial nano machines if you like and we can retrofit them with we can fuse them and make hybrids 
with biology by using evolution. We may, might make a very nice way to repair people's immune systems without rejection because we're using foreign technology that doesn't depend upon carbon, so you're not having any of that. Rejection, the body just ignores yeah. it. So there's all sorts of interesting technologies there, which is my main reason for, for not giving up on, on it in terms of really trying to develop a practical solution in the laboratory. Because if we can start to evolve solutions to problems, then um, that's going to be really exciting. Because um, forgetting about the philosophy, you will be able to solve problems you couldn't even begin to think about before. I think that's awesome. Um, we're getting towards the, the end of the show here, and uh, one, one question that someone in the chat room was wondering is if you were working on any kind of a gaming platform for this, this, uh, this evolution, this inorganic evolution. Is there anything that could be done like, um, you know, in, in biological stuff? I know there's protein folding, fold it, and others that, are, that have been, been created. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we in my group meeting last week, we did one on bio. We we, we present, one of my colleagues presented the bio games, and and there's a lot of people synthetic biology now do it with iGem, um, yep. making bacteria that do things. So yeah, absolutely. And I think it'd be really interesting to understand. Well, the, the, to good, doing a game is cool, but why do it? Well, it tells you what the inputs and outputs are, and it allows you to ma manipulate the system yep. within the framework. So. Whoever came up with that suggestion is right on the money because we just really started to think about how to deploy that idea in the laboratory just last week. So that's, they're right on the money. That's great. I think it's I think it's fantastic, and it would also allow you know kind of the distributed processing of all the people who want to play the game, so you can yeah. run massive replications. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And wouldn't it be interesting to try and simulate the replicators and then do it in reality? and see if you can use the chemistry to make the model. And so basically you have a competition between what you simulate yep. in the computer and what you do in the chemistry lab. And that, that, that also will throw up new ideas. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, so much for joining me this last hour. It's been such a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm sure that your lab and uh, your conversations on a daily basis are really interesting as a result of bringing this idea out to the public and talking about it. Okay, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you about it today. You're welcome. And anybody out there who is interested in hearing more or looking into it, uh, if you haven't seen it already, Lee Cronin, as we mentioned earlier, has a TED Talk that is available online. You can go to croninlab.com. And additionally, uh, Professor Cronin is on Twitter. So you can uh, find Lee Cronin on Twitter. and and chat him up there but <laughs> about some of these some of these great ideas and um, next week we're gonna be talking about something else super sciencey so I hope that you will join me again next week for another hour of sciencey fun I am dr. Kiki and until next week you can find my sciencey pursuits on Twitter Facebook Google Plus all over the place. Just look for Dr. Kiki. I am out there. You can subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour in iTunes, or you can just go to twit.tv forward slash Kiki to find past episodes. Additionally, they are up on YouTube, so you can watch them e easily there. Um, and if you need even more sciencey goodness than this hour provides, you can find my other show, This Week in Science, also on the web, twist.org, for um, more sciencey goodness. I will see you next week. Thank you so much for your time. Remember, all I ask is one hour a week, and I hope it made your world a whole lot more interesting. And now, your science meditation of the week. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium.
There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercury and molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, kryptonium, and radon, xenon, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. And I think there have been some uh, additional discoveries since that song was written, but it's always fun. Tom Lehrer, for those of you who are interested. Thank you. 